how are we going to define success? All right? How are we going to define success in our kids? One of the mistakes that we make too often is that we look at a kid in front of us, whether that kid's four or whether that kid's eight, we look at the kid in front of us and we um, uh, decide whether or not they're successful. And how do we decide whether, decide whether or not they're, they're successful? By two things. Number one, are they happy? And number two, um, uh, how are they doing in school? When we do this, we actually, in some ways, undermine their long-term success. Let's talk about happiness first. The first thing, um, this is the right one. All right. Um, no, we're good. Just let's just get started. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Boom. All right. Slideshow. We really did test this. I swear this was working. It's the first thing I did when I came in. Okay? All right. So, um, how are we going to define success? We're good now. How are we going to define success? First thing is, when you're looking at success and you have a four-year-old in front of you, it's very easy, to, um, and you're thinking about happiness, it's very easy to make the four-year-old happy. How do you make them happy? You give them a cookie, right? And then you have a 12-year-old. How do you make the 12-year-old happy? You give him a bike. How do you make the 16-year-old happy? You give him a car, which you factually should not. Well proven. But it's easy to make a kid happy. What I need us to do is to stop looking at the kids in front of us and begin looking at the 35-year-old that we're building or educating. How many people are parents in this room? So mostly you're going to be thinking about your own kids today. I just want to tell you that. It's what happens. All right? But when you're raising a child, or whether you're preparing a child to um, lead us into the future, um, you've got to begin thinking about them as 35-year-olds. So what does happiness look like when you're 35? What happiness looks like when you're 35 is having a sense of meaning in your life, having a sense of purpose in your life. That's what it looks like when you're 35, right? What else do we need the 35-year-old to look like? We need them to be compassionate, to be kind, when they see a human being who is in trouble, rather than averting their eyes like so many of us do, we look to try to figure out how to solve the problem. Rather than looking at that human being and saying, what's wrong with you? We instinctively understand that something happened to them. When we have those kind of kids, then we're prepared to have them repair the world. They need to be compassionate, to be kind, to be empathetic. What else do they need to have? They need to have tenacity. They need to have grit. Are you guys up on the grit literature, Angela Duckworth? Here's it in a nutshell. We used to think that the most important variable towards success was intelligent, but intelligence. But think about all the smart people you know who are complete dopes, right? <laughs> right? So the thing that really seems to matter the most, more than intelligence, is grit. What is grit? Here's how she would define it. How do you see the world? Do you see the world as a marathon, life as a marathon, in which case you're looking far into the distance and planning on the future? Furthermore, um, uh, you, know, you can never um, run that marathon without a lot of practice, without pushing yourself beyond any limits you imagined you ever had, and without having a team behind you who believes in your potential to make it. Or, do you see life as a sprint? Because if you see life as a sprint, you're going to go right there, you're going to do whatever it takes to win, including tripping the guy next to you. When, furthermore, when you look at life as a sprint, what happens when you fall down? The race is over. When you look at life as a marathon, what happens when you fall down? You get back up, all right? So you need people who are those 35-year-olds who are going to have tenacity, who are going to have grit. We need kids who are going to be creative and innovative because all of the best ideas haven't been thought of yet, period. And anything that we do that stifles creativity and innovation, like taking away art and music classes, anything that we do that stifles creativity and innovation, like making kids terrified of a B plus because they think the stakes are too high, undermines their long-term future. What else do we need? We need people who have our collaborative skills, because the best ideas never come to fruition by themselves. Now, we very clearly need people who honor diversity, not token diversity, honor diversity of thought, who feel challenged by it, and who like people who think differently and who come from different backgrounds. 
What else do we need? We need people who um, are coachable. That means that they can take constructive criticism, meaning that they don't have imposter syndrome because that stifles their ability to take constructive criticism, meaning that they're not so fearful of disappointing someone that as soon as you come in and give them constructive criticism, they fall apart. And what else do we need? We need kids who are going to be resilient. Kids who are going to be able to bounce back from difficult times. Because as much as we wish that we could wrap kids in, our, in these quilts, the reality is that we can't. So we need kids who can handle all of this. Can we agree that we, as a district, are really trying to prepare people to be 35-year-olds? And when we frame it in this way, later when we talk about perfectionism and what overpressuring is doing to kids, we'll understand how it undermines success. You'll also understand how trauma undermines success. So, today, three models. It's a balancing act, all right? It is a problem to believe that any single model has all the answers. And that's why I've balanced these three models. For example, trauma. So I am... Um, the uh, National Boys and Girls Club of America Resilience Guy. I'm also the same role for Covenant House International. And let me tell you about these organizations. When a given, or, um, given site decides to become trauma-informed, what happens is that you then begin really understanding that almost all behavior can be traced to something that happened to someone. And as a result, you can very easily forgive everything. Right? You can just begin saying, well, he did this because bad things happened to him. And then you convert, that's a slippery slope towards not holding kids accountable. Do you, see, do you see it happening? And when you don't hold kids accountable for their behavior, you are actually oppressing them. When you don't hold kids accountable, you actually become one more element in their lives that says, you know what, I don't think you're capable. Which is so counter to the positive youth development movement that you would never do it. All right, which is why you've got to integrate these models. So let's begin.